Welcome to the Leading Hope Podcast with Kevin Jack. Your influence will lead people somewhere, lead them towards hope. Everyone has 20 minutes to learn to become a better leader. Make it count. Welcome to Leading Hope with Kevin Jack. I'm your host, VJ Williams, here with my friend and pastor, Kevin Jack. Thank you for joining us and taking time out of your day to become a better leader. We will release a new episode every Wednesday, so we'd love for you to subscribe, share on social media, and bring others along with us on this journey of becoming a better leader. Visit leadinghope.online to get updates and find out more about the Leading Hope community. Today's episode, episode two, is the enemies of resilience. Kevin, take it away. So uh, so last week when we talked about Hey, what is resilience? Why is resilience so important? We said resilience is the thing that will help you lead long, lead well, help you keep going. Resilience is the thing that keeps leaders in the game. Otherwise, you'll be out and you won't make an impact. And the reality is this is that there are some common things that are going to be the enemies of resilience in your life. And the enemies of resilience aren't obstacles. The enemies of resilience aren't, oh, it got super hard and it was super difficult and there were late nights and I didn't know how to conquer this challenge. Those are not the enemies of resilience because you're aware of those. And so because your mindset is aware of those, you have an expectation in advance that enables you to rise up and to meet those challenges. And so I want to talk this week about three common enemies of resilience that you might not be as aware of, and you may be aware of, but you may not be focused on them. And so I want to draw your focus to these three things so you're able to combat them so you can make a difference, not just in the short term, but in the long term. As uh, one of the podcasts that I listen to, Craig Rochelle's leadership podcast, uh, he talks about it this way. He says, we underestimate what God can, or we overestimate what God can do in a day. And we underestimate what God can do in a lifetime of oh, faithfulness. Man. Yeah. And so we want you to lead for the long haul and to make that impact. So here is the first enemy of resilience. The first enemy of resilience is a lack of clarity on why. Ooh. A lack of clarity on your purpose. And the reality is this. If you don't know, and not just know, if you don't know and feel the purpose to which you are called, the purpose to which you are doing this, the reason behind everything then the obstacles will feel too much. And uh, Simon Sinek has a fantastic book Mm. titled Start With Why that gets into that and says, hey, you need to know for your organization, for everything else, we usually focus on what and how, but you need to start with why. You need to start with the reason behind this. And so one of the ways uh, that we've kind of adopted that or are beginning to adopt that within our church is uh, most churches have a mission statement, and most mission statements of churches are very, very similar in some sense. And I'll be honest within this. There's probably a mission statement at this church at some point in time that's buried in a folder that a small committee drafted at one point in time. But even as the... uh, lead pastor at this church. I have no (laughs) earthly idea what that mission statement is, nor do I think does anyone else within our congregation. No. Okay. And so one of the things that we're working on is the reality that, uh, that we do have a common purpose, but we also have unique things that have brought us to the table. And so our whole thing here is that we want to be hope. That's our thing with this podcast. We want you to lead towards hope because you your leadership is going to have an impact and it can be despair or hope. We want you to lead towards hope. Yep. And so our belief as a church that our mission is this, is that we are here to be hope. But then there's the second piece that I love that we're developing. It's this idea, why are you here? Like like we, we as a collective group, that's what we're here. That's our mission. We're here to be hope to a hurting world. But I'll tell you, I'm here. Like the reason why I'm a part of this is because when I was in high school, I invited my friend to church who needed to know God, who wanted to know God, and he was bored out of his mind because the service was not created and crafted for him at all. And then he left and he never came back. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm here is because I want to correct that problem. And as I've heard people's stories and as I've been in conversations, people have just all these different reasons why they're involved, why they're engaged, why they're serving, why they're sacrificing, why they're passionate about the vision of what we're seeking to do together. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to make everyone aware at a personal level, what is your purpose? Because I believe that if people are incredibly clear on what their reason why is, then resilience is built into that. And so if if you're struggling from obstacles and difficulties, one of the first things you can do is to uh, gain clarity on why. So that's the first enemy. The second enemy of resilience 
is the excuses that we make. The enemy of resilience is not outside us. It is within us. And it comes out as the excuses that we make. We abdicate responsibility when we make excuses. Anytime we make excuses or we blame external forces, we abdicate responsibility. And this is the most important piece is we make ourselves helpless. When I blame things that I cannot control, and I say the reason why something is how it is, is because of this other thing, and there's nothing I can do about it, what I am stating in that moment is I am helpless. Why was I late? Because my kids. Why was I late? Because my wife. (laughs) Why was I late? Because of traffic. Yeah. Why was I late? Because I didn't plan in advance. And if I'm not willing to get to that level in which I'm not going to blame external factors and take responsibility for myself, then I'm claiming I am helpless to make things better. And helplessness is where resilience goes to die. Mm. Like there is nothing like if you want to know if you feel helpless in any way, you will not have endurance as a leader. If you feel helpless in any way and you go, well, there is nothing I can do about this. Then I just want to tell you, like, if you're in posi- you're in a position and you find yourself saying, well, there's nothing that I can do about this, turn in your resignation now because you are no good to the organization that you claim to serve in that moment. And so the resilient leader takes responsibility for making things better, and it does not get it, give in to the enemy of making excuses. So that's the first two. The third enemy of resilience that is common that you may not be aware of or you may be aware of and you just need to be more mindful of is boredom. Mm. Not obstacles, not difficulties, but boredom. And the reality is this, is that at times we just get tired of showing up. (laughs) We get tired of doing the work. The work at times can become monotonous. It's interesting from a church perspective is uh, for for those who are coming in, those who aren't involved, those who aren't serving, or from an outsider, uh, what we do at times can just seem absolutely amazing. Like our worship services are interesting. They're engaging. I I hope they're interesting. They're engaging. So we were like, oh, that's so cool. But here's the hard is we run through the same rhythm most weeks. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, we run through the same thing. I'll be, this is total confession right here. Some of you may be uncomfortable with this. <laughs> Christmas is coming up. I have now preached a Christmas message for 13 years. And, and I will come up with something. I will search the scriptures. I will pray to God. And I believe that he will have something that he has for his people. But there's this little thought in the back of my head as Christmas is coming up. This is like, oh, I've got to <laughs> preach a Christmas message Again. Here we go again. Like, oh, what on earth am I going to talk about this time that isn't the same exact thing that I have talked about for the last 13 years? And it's just easy within that because the tasks become similar that to get bored over time. But boredom is an enemy of resilience. And I was, uh, while I was on vacation, I was reading this book titled, titled The Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod. And it was just all about taking the morning, making the morning part the best part of your day and use that as a time to learn, to grow, to develop yourself, to be better. And um, and a lot of the book uh, was common, but there was this one statement in the book that, oh my goodness, I, I think I wore a hole in the page. I highlighted it so much. I thought it was that important. And he says this, the greatest villain of self-improvement is boredom. Mm. The reason why we don't get better is because we get bored. Why? Why aren't... Why aren't so many people better at what they do? They don't want to put in the reps. Like it gets tiring doing, if you would take it as a sports metaphor within there, doing the same drills, shooting free throws over and over again, it's not always interesting. And so the reason why we don't get better, the reason why we don't keep going is just because we're bored of the tasks. And so here's the beauty of it. Let's connect this to that second enemy of making excuses. You are responsible for making it interesting. Like, no one else is responsible for making it interesting for you. You are, you are not at the will of other people. You are, not, you are not demeaned by others because you're not making it interesting. Like, so I say this within this, like, take responsibility for that role within there. 
take responsibility go, if boredom is an enemy of resilience, I'm not going to make excuses that blame my family, my boss, my coworkers, the company, the policies for why I'm so bored at the work that I'm doing. I'm a leader. I want to make things better. I want to get better personally. And so I'm going to take an active role within this and say, hey, if it's, if it's boring, it's my job to make it interesting. If I'm tired of it, it's my job within there to do something different that is going to make it engaging to myself. And so those are the three enemies of resilience, a lack of clarity on why, the excuses that we make, and boredom. Oh man, that's uh, that's fantastic. Uh, that's that's going to be very helpful to someone. Uh, it certainly will be helpful for to me. Um, I've got three points that I want to uh, to to just capture from my side of it from what you said. Before we do that, I've got three questions. Uh, let's go ahead with the first. Uh, the three enemies of resilience. Uh, obviously, we think that's really good. Really want to explore the last one: boredom. We get tired of showing up. I've seen this many times in many different fields that I've been in throughout my life. You see which... it every time you go to a restaurant. <laughs> yeah. You can tell who is bored and who has been there for a while. That's that's exactly right. And, and uh, you know, they get into the field or whatever their job is. Uh, it, they, the job doesn't evolve. Um, the work seems monotonous. Uh, what can leaders do to enrich the environment so that the team feels fresh? Oh, that's great. Well, I would say uh, one of the first things within there is you have to stay fresh yourself. Oh, cool. And so that will have a ripple effect on your team. If your team feels like you're just showing up and going through the motions, they're going to do the same thing. So uh, one of the things that I changed is I switched on Sunday mornings from a teaching style to a preaching style. And so our whole team got to watch me work through this difficulty of gaining a new skill, gaining a new ability. And we're not going to focus on what are the distinctions between a teaching style and a preaching style, but just know this, a teaching style is what I knew the churches I attended had. It's what I was familiar with. It's what I had done all my life and realized I, I was honestly, in some sense, I was kind of bored with it. I was just going through the motions. So I took the time to learn a new skill. So I think that's a big thing first off learn is that skill. you you stay fresh yourself. You yeah. do what you need to do. But then the other thing I would say, and I want to be very careful on how I word this because I don't want to take this the wrong way. It is not your job to challenge your team. It is your job to get your team, to challenge your team to challenge themselves. And so if you're team feels bored and you wholly take on that responsibility to make it interesting, they will always de be dependent upon you. Uh. And then the next time they'll get bored, they'll blame the leader. And next time they get bored, they'll blame the meeting rhythm. And next time they get bored, they'll blame the schedule. Oh, that's good. And it's not your responsibility. It is their responsibility. Uh, one of the beauties we have within ministry, and I know not every job has this, uh, we have an unbelievable amount of flexibility with our schedules, mm. like an incredible amount of flexibility with our schedules. And so one of the things I'll tell our team is that if you're bored, like it's your job to make it interesting. You can within this do the task and get the work that you need done, but also at the same time, create a job that you are fascinated by. And I want to say within there, and I don't mean this heavy handed anyway, is I think a lot of people, especially when they've been in a work for a little period of time have assumed that the way that they do it is the way that they have to do it. And no one else has imposed those standards upon them. And there's far more creativity and flexibility in their work than they would ever imagine that they actually have. So challenge your team to challenge themselves to not allow boredom to take away their resilience and energy. That's good. That's, that's really good. I love that. Uh, how, how do how do we want to say this? How do great leaders create a culture where excuses are the exception and not the rule? Well, uh, I want to say just as a pastor, like you pray <laughs> for Jesus to come. <laughs> there you go. Because, <laughs> Woo! yeah, at one uh, point you're like, oh, that would be yeah. amazing within there. If that was involved. actually Clapping the case. Involved. Yeah. Uh, I would say, I mean, it comes back to the majority of what we know. Don't model it. Don't don't become an excuse maker yourself. Don't blame your team. Don't blame your people. We we do not blame the people for where the leaders have led them. We take responsibility within there. So for one, you make sure that you're never modeling excuses yourself. Mm. Uh, but then the second piece is you don't allow it. 
And when excuses pop in, you switch, you quickly switch that conversation from an excuse making conversation to a responsibility claiming conversation. That's good. Um, And then lastly, uh, can you give a few practical ways anyone who is a leader today that's listening right now can create a clear why? Oh, that's good. Uh, So back to that first one. So that first enemy of a lack of clarity on why within there. For one, there's a lot of great books out there on crafting those statements. We mentioned Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why, is absolutely fantastic. Uh, Andy Stanley has a great book titled Visioneering, which talks about crafting that future, but also gets back to the purpose statement. Uh, But there's some there's some really functional, like practical things you can do that aren't this massive overarching purpose. Uh, And one of them is just to constantly teach purpose into everything that you do. And as a statement, that may not mean much. uh, But one of the things that we do in our worship services, uh, we call it create context. Let let people know why we do this. Mm. And so we stand for the reading of Scripture. We tell people every single Sunday, we stand for the reading of Scripture because it postures us as a readiness to receive God. We are active participants in this. And we say it almost every single week. Now, yeah. sometimes we'll say it in a different way. What we're doing is we're teaching purpose. And all throughout we'll say, hey, this is why we do this. This is why we do this. And that's not just a spiritual worship service thing. That's a functional organizational thing because people need to know why. When you have a meeting, you explain, this is the purpose of this meeting. This is why we have gathered together. This is how it fits into the larger vision. That takes 15 seconds. Yeah. Like it takes no time at all. But you constantly do those things to restate for people, set the context of what is the purpose for what's happening here. That's great. That's that's good. I love I love that. Uh, you know, the way you create a clear why is by continue to teach purpose. That's that's a really helpful note. I think uh, Rick Warren made a statement years ago. He says you can teach yourself out of every problem, and that may be a slight overstatement, but it's worked for him. Yeah, it's practical. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's good. Um, I you know earlier in this segment that you uh, had brought up, and I I think this is someone that. Um, man, it just resonates with me. And I think a lot, and and we talk about our hope team and we talk about volunteers. We talk about staff, right? People that are here employed, looking to do whatever that God has put on their uh, heart and their life and their purpose. Um, And you said, uh, everyone needs to ask this question. Why are you here? Mm -hmm. I think that's, I mean, I know we don't have a lot of time left, but man, if you have any more on that, I think, I think that's a question anyone needs to be asking anywhere Wherever they are. So let's so let's talk about that like broadly within there to go. Why if if you feel if in that if you feel a lack of resilience in your marriage, you are tired of going home and doing dishes and doing laundry and just going through the rhythm. Mm. I would ask you, why are you there? Like why why are you married to begin with? Are you married as a functional purpose, as a way that you just don't want to be alone? Was marriage a cure for your own personal loneliness? Or did you just think it was the thing that you were supposed to do? Because what we believe deep, 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 we believe what Scripture teaches is that we get married as a model. Scripture talks about like this. It's a, it's a metaphor for Christ in his church who gave himself up for her. And so when I get married, what I acknowledge within there is that I am giving the rest of my life for the benefit of this other person, not my own personal benefit. That's good. I am giving the rest of my life for the benefit of this other person. And the reality is, is that when I do that, I experience joy, not happiness. I experience a deeper thing that is not based upon my circumstances. And so uh, just full confession is I forget that purpose. Yes. (laughs) And sometimes I'm married for me, not for them. Yes. Sometimes I'm married for me and not for my personal growth, spiritual growth within there. Oh, and anytime man. I forget that purpose, I get really tired of doing the things that I'm doing. But when I connect back to it, all the work is easy. Fulfillment, yeah. Fulfilled and ready to go. Man, we're going to leave it right there. That's a fantastic <laughs> thought to think about this whole week. We're so glad that you decided to join us this week. Uh, look, we we know that uh, we love that you guys are able to join us each week. Continue to subscribe. We can't wait to hear for you. We'll see you back next week for episode three Uh, maintaining your edge, which is going to be incredible. I can't wait to join you. And remember, everyone has 20 minutes to learn to become a better leader. Make it count.